One word. Trauma. Jessica Jones opens with her taking photos of a dude's wife cheating on him with his brother. And upon receiving the news, the dude almost attacks Jessica, which leads to her throwing him out before asking for the bill in a very casual way. And then there's the matter of your bill. This is a show that explores the worst side of people and the limits of dealing with pain, as she describes. Knowing it's real means they gotta make a decision. One, do something about it. Or two, keep denying it. So yeah, let's study it. Uh -oh. way to understand trauma, here I go I know, is to treat our individual identities as a story with a continuity to it. It can be our personal narratives as the son, daughter, father, mother, student, etc. These roles allows us to absorb experience and turn them into memories, like a chapter in an ever-expanding book. Subsequently, trauma is when an experience is so painful and oppositional to the logic of your narrative that your continuity can't absorb it anymore. It doesn't fit or make any sense. Like if you lose your parents or your child or your life's work fails on you or become a victim of a crime. As a result, the identity you've always defined yourself ceases to be convincing and your relationship with your own memories become uncontrollable for the reason that it's difficult to remember anything else and even harder to imagine a future. Your entire being is orientated backwards. As Emily Keatley and Michael Pickering said from, you know what, trauma. What it denotes is a condition of individual psychic damage of such severity that the person who suffers from it is unable to make experience storyable and knowable. Trauma entails a failure of the autobiographical project because it produces experience that is not amenable to assimilation. It is an engagement with the past in the absence of mnemonic imagination. The self of the traumatized victim cannot remember itself to itself and cannot imagine itself whole. I hope you like that quote, by the way, because it's getting harder and harder to find new ones. Jessica Jones is relevant to this topic because the original source material it's based on and the show itself is centered on themes of Although the comics, Alias, and the show does have wildly different approaches and resolutions, and I'll get to that. But the purpose of this essay is to treat trauma and memory as a through line throughout each Jessica Jones season and see what it has to say and how it portrays it. So that's, this essay is going to be a lot looser, like the Daredevil one. Again, I don't flirt. I just say what I want. And what do you want? Marvel's Jessica Jones is three seasons and an appearance in a spin-off show. Furthermore, the first season is explicitly inspired by Brian Michael Bendis' Alias series, which not only introduced a character, but was a debut title for the Marvel Max imprint, so it's oddly poetic that this show helped launch the darker Marvel Netflix verse back in the day. Subsequently, the character is very postmodern for the reason that she's defined by the fact that she rejects the genre's expectations by applying uncomfortable psychological realism to the genre's cliches. Both in the show and the comics, she gained her powers through a fairly cliched circumstance. As a teenager, she was exposed to radioactive materials during a car accident she caused when she picked on her brother and distracted her father. We play! I don't play, honey. Because he yells the loudest? It's not fair, it's mine! Fine. She broke it! Jessica, why did Brad! you do it? Therefore, guilt, alienation, and as a victim of chance is what propelled her with a desire to become someone better. By the way, one of the cool ways the comics emphasize this is have Jessica Jones go to the same school as Peter Parker in a freaking Steve Ditko style artwork. Consequently, during Jessica's first bout as a hero, she bumps into Kilgrave, a dude who can make anyone do what he says, and he exploits her. There's a fantastic Sejuan place around the corner. You like Chinese. Come on until he sent her to attack Daredevil, but she ends up attacking Wanda, which resulted in her almost being punched to death by Vision. In the show, she kills Luke Cage's wife, which caused such a strong mist of emotions that she just walks away. She keeps walking for as long as she could. And this is where the story begins. Life after being a hero. 
The first season is 13 episodes, and is structured like a 13 hour long film. Act 1 episode 1 through 4 introduces Jessica's existential nightmare of a home. She's a ball of sarcastic drunk nihilism, who makes a living as a private investigator. I stand in dark alleys and wait to take pictures of people boning. She's good at her job because she's directly comfortable with being voyeuristic and observing the worst in people, and can be cynical enough to treat people as desperate pleas as a business. You charge hourly plus expenses. I'll get a standard contract. But bizarrely enough, her biggest weakness is her sympathy for the vulnerable, because they either take advantage of her or they drag her into something over her head. This is all exemplified by the big case of the season, with Starlight, a young girl who has suffered a similar fate by her old abuser, Kilgrave. Come on, let's go! I can't. He told you not to move. I wet the bed. Jessica rescues her, but due to some hidden orders, Starlight ends up killing her own parents. So just as Jessica tries to do the right thing, she makes it worse. Get ready for this to happen a lot. However, before Jessica Jones flees from the city and away from him, she chooses to stay and go to war. Act 2 episodes 5 through 10 becomes a cat and mouse game. Before Kilgrave appears in full, he exists like winds of paranoia and panic. There to whisper, to lick, and to strip away Jessica's control of her own life. As a result, his memory is something that she's actively fighting against with her job, her casual dalliances, and with alcohol. These are all opiums, if you will, used to create a sense of continuity separate from him and what he did to her. Bird Street. Although when he does appear as a full-fledged character, he's not quite what you expect. Kilgrave is really different in the show compared to him in Alias. I mean, yeah, they're both abusive douchebags who exploited Jessica, but in the show, he's genuinely in love with her and is trying his best to re-establish their relationship. Kilgrave buys and restores her childhood home, tries to earn her consent. I promise I won't touch you until I get your genuine consent. Right then? and aids with solving a hostage situation, for the reason that deep down inside, he longs for Jessica's idealism in an almost fetishistic way. Like when he got to use her phone, he's smiling and giggling. I didn't have this. A home, loving parents, a family. As a child, he was held against his will by his parents for experiments, who loved him and tried to save him from his own brain disease, but their cruel approach made him unable to value human life. Therefore, even as an adult, he's still a little kid who never got a childhood. But due to his ability to get what he wants, he can't help but to turn everyone into his toys. As Jessica said, All this shit that you do is because nobody ever taught you how to be good. I truly hope you're not laughing at me, Jessica. No, I'm not. I'm just thinking. In his own myopic way, he wants her to be the home he never got, the person that didn't leave, unlike his parents. I wondered if that would make you proud of me. Oh, of course we're proud of you, Kevin. We love you. Then why did you leave? Furthermore, unlike the comics, he actually did get physical with her during the period of mental exploitation. In Alias, Purple Man merely treated Jessica as a toy, there to watch him do it with other girls and to tell her to want it, and to shout at her whenever he was foiled. As a result, by making Kilgrave more sincere, the show has blurred the lines of morality and even the playing field. Their battle is about who has authorship over each other's story. Kilgrave wants to surrender his, or at least as far as his narcissism would allow. Alba! If I'm not back within two hours, please remove the skin from each other's faces. And Jessica wants to reclaim hers. They control each other's identity, which is anchored when her and Kilgrave are given a peaceful opportunity to solve everything by living together and having her mentor him, to guide him to become a better person. We never appreciate anything I do for you. You can't listen to me. You don't need ears. You raped me again no. and again and again. How am I supposed to know? I never know if someone is doing what they want or what I tell them to. Oh, poor you. You have no idea. Stop, stop, stop. It's all right. I'm here, Jessica. I have to painstakingly choose every word I say. What would you do if you could harness Kilgrave's powers for good? Put the gun down. Turn yourself over to the police. Thank you. Thank you. You can, he's a psychopath. But what if you could teach him to be more like you? Show him how to use his powers in a positive way. That man almost blew his brains out, which I genuinely thought was the right thing to do. I can't be a hero without you. How would I do that? You would have to stay with him. Maybe we can balance the scales a bit. 
Oh, well, we should certainly try. But she stops it and takes advantage of his vulnerability to kidnap and imprison him. She needs a confession to save Starlight, but due to Hogarth, everything goes wrong. But during the scuffle, Jessica discovers she's also immune to Kilgrave's words due to the trauma of killing Luke Cage's wife. He said, let go, and I didn't. I'm free. In Act 3, Episodes 10 through 13, all of Jessica's acts of altruism are torn down and destroyed. The evidence is turned to ash. She loses Luke Cage, the only person who gave her comfort, and Starlight takes herself out of the equation, so Jessica doesn't have anything to hold her back anymore. Therefore, once again, the world denies her the prospect of being a traditional hero. Let me handle this. She'll never kill me. Despite her calloused, hard-bitten, and frankly poorly styled facade, she still hopes that at her core, she might just be a hero but only if she can save you. Subsequently, within the final confrontation, Jessica pretends to have no control over his upgraded powers and lets him leave with Trish. So when he returns to her, she snaps his neck. However long it takes, I know, I know you will feel what I feel. Afterwards, Hogarth protects Jessica and everything is over. In Alias, she's not directly immune, but Jean Grey plants a psychic defense trigger in her during the recovery process. So she's able to knock out by sucker punching Purple Man in the face to save the Avengers at the end. It's a bit different. I know I've gone on about this loads, but it's important to reiterate this. To overcome trauma, it requires writing a new life story that can accommodate and make use out of the painful experiences. So it no longer contradicts with who you are. In both stories, Jessica Jones is saved by her using her painful experiences to beat her abuser. If she didn't go through what happened to her, then she wouldn't have the defense. However, in both versions, she lands in dramatically different places. Originally, Jessica writes a new story by moving into a committed relationship with Luke Cage, keeping her baby and becoming a happier, clearer person. Not a superhero or a PI, just someone who loves herself enough to be able to look after someone else. This wasn't the ending Brian Michael Bendis expected, but when he reached it, he realized it perfectly closed a chapter in Jessica's life. However, in the show, Jessica returns to her usual life as a PI, albeit in a slightly less lonely way with Malcolm now and her reconnected sister. Messages. Hey, are you the chick who saved all the people on the docks? I'm being strong on for rent money and I thought- Deleted. Therefore, on one hand, yeah, this is a TV show, so the detective format has to stay. You can't completely suddenly just change the genre. Not to mention, Luke Cage has his own individual show now, so you can't just merge them. But on the other hand, Alias Investigations itself is recontextualized. This job is no longer a phase, but is the new chapter. One that she wrote for herself before the show began and will continue to author after it ends. And by coming back to us, even after killing a dude, it shows she's resilient enough to keep writing this life story. There's before Kilgrave and there's after Kilgrave. Jessica Jones is reintroduced in The Defenders, exactly how you expect, waking up at a bar. Come on, the night's just getting started. Night? She helps Trish with a parking issue and is off on another case, in which, once again, her good intentions gets her into trouble. But this time, something is different. Whatever he's doing, I'll be find him. Jess is more chill. Despite rejecting her superhero reputation, she's explicitly more of an affectionate person and is far more confident in shutting down references to Kilgrave. I know what happened with Kilgrave, so... This has nothing to do with that. Okay, great. Furthermore, to emphasize the effectiveness of her new self-esteem in managing her trauma, they pair up with Matt Murdock, who has a similar history of being corrupted by a morally dubious relationship, a life of punishment from doing the right thing, and now is suffering from an identity crisis. Well, I'm trying very hard to ignore my soul. But where he hides his downfall with a smile, she hides her rise with a frown. Sorry about the mess. It's all right, you should see my place. On one hand, it's a clever subversion of the comics, because there she idolized Matt and would go on about how awesome he is all the time. But on the other hand, Jessica's story is now a loop. It originally began with her quitting her ambitions as a superhero, but now she's returned to it with more moral confidence than the actual dude in the costume to the extent that she helps him author his life by explaining his past in storytelling terms. You know, Lexi, you remind me of a friend of mine. Excuse me? A pictures asshole. His dad was a boxer. 
who got in way over his head and got himself killed. Look, I've been down this road before. I know what we're up against. I know who you are. <laughs> no, you don't trust me. Yes, I do. You're the devil of Hell's Kitchen. And for a long time, my friend thought his dad abandoned him, too. That is the nicest thing you've ever said to me. Yeah, don't get used to it. Till one day he learned the truth. That his dad was actually killed because he wanted to stop being a criminal. Because he wanted his son to be proud of him. Furthermore, when the Defenders finally assemble, she also reunites with Luke Cage. In Season 1, Luke was someone that Jessica stalked and was deeply attracted to because despite her protective shell, he's able to both read her like a book and offer the kindness and emotional safety she desperately longs for. Except you've been watching me like a hawk since you walked in. Force of habit. Or oh, it's your way of flirting. However, things then got really, really, really freaking convoluted between them. First, Luke Cage discovers JJ killed his wife, and then he went after Kilgrave, which then used him to make him forgive JJ, but then maybe not. I forgive you, and I'll say it every day. Or as long as you need to hear it. I wrote it! And then in his own show, it's revealed that Luke Cage's wife, Reva, was actually involved in a science conspiracy that was exploiting him. That was her job. She lied to you about her involvement. I promise I'll explain it all. She lied again when she erased both of you from existence. Thank you for saving my life. She knew the stakes. So there's literally no hard feelings anymore, and I guess now as adults, they both moved on, and their reconciliation, to an extent, represents a step towards Jessica forgiving herself. You killed my wife. I love the idea of Riva, but not her specifically. It's good seeing you. Yeah even though she keeps yo-yoing her responsibilities. We were first introduced to Jessica and Luke at his bar, and before they bid farewell here in the Defenders, they hang out at a bar again. Yeah, maybe we'll grab a coffee sometime or something. A spark is still there between them, but also the home that she longed for is already with her. You got friends. One of them is in Harlem. However, even though The Defenders is an ensemble, Matt Murdock is really the only real main character with personal stakes in it due to his relationship with Elektra and Stick. Danny is mostly treated as a plot device, and Luke and Jessica function mainly as the muscle, and to give a face for the broader New York setting. Although by representing the city, it subtly builds her up as a credible hero in the traditional sense, to the extent that she smacks Madame Gao in the frickin' face of a pipe, pretends to be indifferent as a distraction, and even saves everyone at the end when the elevator gets screwed. Jessica's story may have began with her leaving her ambitions to be a hero, but in the end, everything always loops back to her role as one. Therefore, we know the only continuity that matters is this one. So when she returns to her office, just as season one ended, like Luke, Matt, and even Danny, she's one of them. One of the best. Tell me, did you enjoy beating those thugs? Yes. Yeah. Why? Because I helped someone. I made a difference. So you're really gonna do it? You're gonna be a hero. I told you to stay close. Did Sam say it to me? The whole time he had me, there was some tiny corner of my brain that tried to get out. And I'm still fighting. I won't stop fighting. But if you give up, I lose. At the end of season one, Jessica's final monologue began with... They say everyone's born a hero. But if you let it, life will push you over the line until you're the villain. Season 2 tells the story of these words. It opens with Jessica Jones finding someone cheating again, but this time the client wants her to kill him due to her reputation as a superhero. He deserves it. That's your code, right? Yeah, I'm getting t-shirts made. And I'll triple your fee. But JJ rejects her, he exposes her, and affirms that she's not a murderer. I don't kill people, because I'm not a murderer. As a result, Jessica's self-identity is the key interest of this season, not her relationship with her past, but her confidence with who she's become. However, her authorship begins to be challenged by Trish, who keeps pushing her to finding out how she got her powers. Knowing what they did to you might help you. No. 
I can't change the past. So it's gonna stay where it is. I'll deal with this on my own. So effectively, this season reconfigures Jessica Jones' character so she's less metatextual, as her origin is no longer just a commentary on the cliches of the genre, but now exists on its own cosmological merits. Furthermore, the car accident is now contextualized as having more traumatic impact on Jess than her year with Kilgrave. As she describes- How you remember? I do remember. I remember being in that car and waking up alone, I will spend the rest of my life trying to forget it. Don't make me cut you out to do that, Trish, please. Jessica also has a new neighbor, Oscar, who's a single dad, painter, and ex-con. Originally, he wanted to kick Jessica out, but then obviously she saves his son and they romantically get together, which is like the most freaking so proper thing I've ever seen. This dude, similar to Luke, offers Jessica a home. However, unlike him, his life is distinctly defined by his son. It's an unmovable continuity within his identity and one that his entire nature bends around. That kid means everything to me. Okay, do you have anyone that makes you feel like that? Or have they all run away from you? Keep this in mind. Afterwards, Jessica finds someone linked to the superpower experiments, and within their first conversation, Jess learns that she actually did die and was only brought back to life, which causes her to wish that she stayed dead. You should have let me die with my family, like I was supposed to. However, the experiment lady scolds her, calling her ungrateful. You had your life! You had your abilities! You survived for a reason! And on one hand, Jessica is totally being unreasonable, and she actively regresses by two seasons, but that's also the point. Because on the other hand, this scene is designed to paint her like an ungrateful teenager arguing with her mom, and it's revealed to be just that. Jessica's mom is alive, and she's got superpowers too. How goofy. Elisa Jones was actually the real survivor of the car accident, and the experiment has given her uncontrollable mood swings, so she spent a long time being monitored. Subsequently, when she escaped the lab with one of the goofiest neck snaps ever, her rage in seeing Jessica's boyfriend seemingly drag her into trouble causes her to smash his brains in. But then, seeing Jessica's heartbreak and pain leads her to retreat back to the lab, where she eventually falls in love and marries the scientist behind the experiment, who kind of looks like Ethan Hawke. It's very distracting. As a result, Jessica's mum's very presence disassembles all the progress she's made, because in the same way Oscar can't help but to define himself by his son, Jessica can't help but to define herself by her mother, as she argued. You connect yourself to your son with every thought. You have no idea how isolated I've been. I had no idea. Therefore, she can't act outside of her identity as a daughter. She loses her ability to write her own life. This reaches its climax when Jessica goes after her mother's abusive guard and accidentally causes his frickin' death. Jessica is forced to cover it up using her PI skills. Jessica's mom is proud of her for killing the guard and they scheme together. I'm so proud of you. Just be okay, mom. I have ghosts too. They fade. Not always. He was an evil prick. Sleep on that. However, this also leads to the return of Kilgrave in her mind to provide commentary and rewrite Jessica's life so it validates her history of killing people. Just like me, murdering me was as poetic as justice ever gets. Therefore, ironically, by definitively killing Purple Man, the closure of his arc is way more messy now and has tainted Jess's conscience like oil and water. Subsequently, Trish finds Dr. Ethan Hawke to repeat the experiment, and she ends up getting superpowers. However, the experiment almost goes wrong and kills her. So Jessica contemplates killing him, but... Your life is over. Hang in there. <sighs> doesn't. All this Ethan Hawke looking dude wanted was to save people, and it worked, but his unethical experiments has also caused so much trauma and pain. You from a hospital bed, 20 days of torture, turned your mother into a murderer. Onto his very subjects that he kills himself and his research, which seems like a bit of an unreasonable plot development because he could literally bring people back to life. Surely, if he could just improve his work, he could have been applied to help people. The world is now a worse place because everyone couldn't move on. Jessica pushes Malcolm away, but during the height of all this stress, she also reconciles with her memory of Kilgrave. He's someone from a life separate from her mother and the rest of this mess. 
a chapter from another book if you will. Therefore her imagination has actually activated his memory to force her to review the story that she's been writing right now. I'm serving too valuable a purpose. To drive me crazy? To ease your mind. Tell you it's okay. I'm okay, you're okay. And notice what needs to be preserved. And currently, it's her belief in herself that she's more than a killer and she has control over who she is. You're in here, but I won. I'm not you. I'm not my mother. I can control myself, which means I'm more powerful than you ever were. To the extent that when he leaves, he says, I'll be around if you need me. She's quite literally appropriated his memory for her own use. Afterwards, hearing the news of Ethan Hawke's death, Jess's mom goes bananas and escapes. In the last act of the season, Jessica and her mom ends up on the run and they end up saving a family. So Jessica contemplates staying with her forever as a superhero mom and daughter squad. I don't know what to do anymore. I tried to convince you. I tried to convict you. I even tried to kill you. You haven't tried to join me. I've seen you trying to do something. To find some meaning, to fulfill some promise. I could do that too. For the reason that the story of the hero and the story of being a daughter are no longer at odds and have a chance of finding balance. However, the police closes in and this dream dies as Elisa goes to sacrifice herself at the fair. She applauds Jessica's capacity to care and finds immense happiness that she put her into the world. Hero isn't a bad word, Jessica. It's just someone who gives a shit and does something about it. Well, I don't. Yes, you do. You do. It sucks and it hurts, but you do. You are far more capable than I ever was. Before being shot no, by Trish, I won't let you. Jess goes bananas and almost shoots her back, but instead stays and takes the rap. You did the only thing you could, Jones. There was no other way. You did the right thing. Trish was the one that pushed Jessica into this case, and in the end, this ends her relationship with her. But despite Jessica's newfounded loneliness and isolation because everyone is gone, she still has enough self-awareness to leave her office to be with Oscar and his son, who are excited to hear the story of her recent heroics. Yeah, did you save anybody today? Yeah, actually, yeah, I did. Season two is the dark second act of Jessica's journey. It interrogates the sturdiness of her grip with her own development by stripping everything back. So the child dies, the adult lives, and she can love herself. But on the other hand, everyone became such a jerk that I just kind of wanted to punch them all in the face. Season 3 is a lot more chill. The two most traumatic experiences has been reconciled with, so Jessica Jones is a more whole person now. Her memories don't control her. It opens with her at the beach, there to take her daughter back to her mother, who's again a douchebag. But unlike the other two openers, there's a sense of humour to it. third rate Joan Jet wannabe! In season one, Jessica constantly needed people to remind her that she did the right thing. Hey, you did a good thing. If he survived, it's because of you. In season two, she constantly reminded herself she is. Because I'm not a killer. And now in season three, she does the right thing without any insecurities. So the lighter tone is a really fun way to immerse us into her newfounded confidence. Can any of them pay full freight? Sure, because helpless people are always rich. You choose. I'll choose. Furthermore, this is accentuated by the development of two relationships. First, Hogarth, Jessica's attorney contact. I'm not gonna beg you for a case. She represented the other extreme of Jess's soul, the pure business opportunist with no moral interest. First, she tried to use Kilgrave for her divorce. Then she discovered she has ALS and gets exploited by frauds in her own firm, for which she does eventually get her brutal revenge. And now she's afraid of dying alone as ALS begins to affect her. Hogarth tries to give Jessica the pills to take her out when she completely loses control. However, Jess goofs on her in order to force her to reassert control over her own life again. You don't know what this is like. You've got to get it right. Get it. As a result, Hogarth went from being a mirror, the lonely future Jess could have had if she continued to push people away and purely embrace her unhealthy, cynical job, but now it's the life she avoided. Jess, in her own sarcastic way, is warmer and genuinely believes in life. I had people around me. 
No one can plan for this. Secondly, Jess gets a new boyfriend character, Eric Gildan, aka Mindwave, who looks exactly like a young David Morrissey, but in real life he's actually married to Effie from Skins. I'm sure my bloody American audience will have absolutely no clue what I'm on. Jessica's relationships with men are often defined by how they alleviate her insecurities because they were all substitutes for her first boyfriend. You got a problem with that? Just adding it to my list of what not to do when I open my own club. He was an equal rebel who got to steal her signature leather jacket and they dreamt of a future together. So for the first time, she didn't feel lonely with him. But Jess's mom literally smashed it. So his death is where Jessica's alcoholism stems from. She believed it was her fault. I did kick their asses and maybe that's why they did this to him. But it's also where she took control of her life because it's directly due to his death that she woke up. So Jess likes her guys to be both a moral safety net and yet act like an opium. Eric is the first guy that isn't really either. It does start out as a casual dalliance, as you would expect, but she ends up being a moral influence on him. Eric has the ability to detect if someone is evil through his headaches. Asshole radar. Usually he uses it to mainly blackmail people to fund his gambling. So like Jess, he started out as an opportunist with a good eye for detecting guilty people and those in need, but he's extremely worn out and cynical and appears to only care about money. It's worse than she says, isn't it? I don't know. Yes, you do, but you're gonna let it slide. Because it doesn't matter. Well, apparently it goddamn matters to me. But he's drawn to Jessica precisely because despite her complimentary attitude, she has a stronger conscience which stops his mind grains, and she mentors him towards a more moral path. As he said, But I don't trust you. I'm coming from you, from a hero. That means only one thing. I gotta do something about that. Therefore, Luke represented regret, Oscar represented family, and Eric represents with great burgers come great responsibility. So it's a kind of a fun little flip. Jessica is strong for her friends as opposed to the other way around. Subsequently, Jessica's adopted family needs her. Dorothy, her adopted mother, hides her to find Trish. Now he's gone. So maybe it is better if you just stay out of the way. Why, because you're a hero now? Yes. The world's moral compass who knows good from bad. Originally, Trish was the one that encouraged Jess to keep helping people, and she partly inspired Jessica to confront Kilgrave and even gave her money for when she didn't want to. She also championed JJ's heroics on the radio and longs for her own powers and fame to help people. But within her altruism are deeply hidden, unconscious, narcissistic motives that's inherited from her mother. You are her protector. She was your conscience. You weren't born to be a best friend. A best friend is a sidekick. It's nothing. I can't do this for you. It's all on you. Is that yours? Tell me you've got this. You wanna come on in? No way, I did it. Shh, ow. Act like a goddamn adult. You have to lead by example. Hundred people could have jobs on this show. For years, they only feed their families if you do your job perfectly every day. I wouldn't want a gaping hole in my head, not knowing what was done to me, whether or not everything I do is shaped by Ow! it. I'd be scared to hell. You'd take that holier than mom look off your face. Well, if I wasn't before. You'd stop this bullshit quest, but you can't stop, can you? No, because Carl experimented on her. She never asked for powers. But she's got them and you don't. And you can't stand that, can you? You are being selfish. Because I owe you? No. <laughs> you don't owe me, baby girl. You owe the world. It gave you a gift. You have to give it back. If you don't have any nice words, you know, why? You single-handedly almost took down IGH with a patsy wig and a cell phone. How much more of a badass do you need to be? You know the answer to that. You're still a hero if nobody thinks you are. You won't survive the tour. A lot of people are depending on me. You need help. Well, you're in no shape to give it. I give a shit what other people think. One day, I came home and he had hit her head into the wall. And that's when I decided he had to go. I touched my mom's blood, smeared it all over my face, and I ran across to the neighbor, Mrs. Levin, and I told her my dad had hit me. You know, mom never contradicted me. I think it's when she first realized I could act. My dad was arrested. I've got this. 
I've got this, or the words that define Trish. She was taught to not accept her role as a sidekick by her mother, but it was a promise that she couldn't keep when she stood next to her sister. Therefore, it's one of the reasons why she pushed Jess into finding out the truth of her origins so she could attain the same powers, and why she got addicted to the IGH drug to get superpowers on her own, and why she now pushes Jessica away so then she can become the very hero that Jess is often reluctant to be. You don't get it, Jess. You're free. You always said you didn't ask for this, but I did, so you can stop trying. I don't need you to be a hero. Nobody does. Furthermore, Malcolm follows a similar arc. He's Jessica's neighbour, who is originally introduced as a junkie that she was sympathetic to, and due to her intervention, she teaches him to strengthen his ability to overcome it. As a result, she became his continuity to stay clean, his capacity to believe in good. Therefore, he cleans her up after a drunken night, fixes the alias office every time something happens, and whenever she is in trouble with people, he's there to ease the tension. Crazy, man. It's all good. But Jessica began to exploit him in season two. No, you know what else isn't easy? Giving a crap about you when you consistently lie to me. During her eviction, she sends Malcolm to the dude who owns the building, knowing he's his type. Next time you plan to objectify me, at least tell me first. And when Malcolm gets seduced and used by Trish to get superpowers, Jessica unfairly blames him. So Malcolm rightfully quits and takes his skills learned from Jessica to become an investigator for Hogarth, but his personal life now has imploded. As he puts money over his conscience over and over and over again, his soul begins to be in pain. Good. I just put an entitled drunk back on the road. I'm not sure that qualifies as good. Okay, effective. My job title is investigator, not fixer. Well, I hired both. If you don't like the job anymore, leave. It was the job. This is mine. Eventually, you become the job. You start disappearing. Hey, I'm still here. Malcolm is also then seduced by Eric's sister, and that makes him rethink his life and his current relationships, because deep down inside him, there's a suppressed primal part of himself that's trying to find a way to redeem him from his current path of lies and greed. Malcolm, like Eric, is effectively who Jessica was at the start of the show, and like Trish, he's the support system that was unfairly discarded, but is now on the path of being restored because Jessica is finally has it together. We got him. Alright. The bad guy this season is a dude called Gregory Salinger, a serial killer narcissist who's jealous and yet feels superior over Jess's superpowers. He frequently outwits her by publicly appearing like a victim. Please send help. Jessica Jones broke into my home and she attacked me. Came from the female vigilante Jessica Jones. He's also defended by Hogarth. She's looking to get publicity for a new firm. Which could be a season 2 type of everyone's being annoying, but everyone is way more reasonable this time, so it's more fun than anything. Mr. Salinger was Vincent Liar. Salinger is a pretty cartoony bad guy. Unlike Kilgrave or Jessica's mum, he's someone that's designed to be hated, so the margins of empathy aren't really ever challenged, but they instead reconcile because through his hateability, everyone can become friends again. Jess and Trish get to be like their old selves again, investigating Salinger's past and find a way to get past an irritating deputy lady. Malcolm can't accept working at the firm anymore, so it becomes a clear crossroad where he and Jess can satisfyingly work together again. And with Jess, she has such a healthy relationship with herself that he can't take advantage for a lack of self-control. All they see is a cheater. No, he's lying to themselves. Dorothy even rises to the occasion supportively. She was once an abusively apathetic and superficial mother, but now she's genuinely looking to help. She supports Trisha's vigilante activities. Her costume is a disaster. Once again, you have hit the nail on the head. When she's used as a distraction, not only does she go with the flow, but she's flattered by the attention. And she's able to get Jessica on TV to protect Salinger's next victim. Why don't you try pulling your head out of your ass? and focusing on the truth for once. Well, that went well. Are you kidding? They are gonna be playing that clip all day long on every platform. If you wanted to get the word out, you nailed it. I am so proud of you both. For a lovely few episodes, there's a calm tidiness to the story, like passing beams of light when the clouds pass the sun. However, everything goes wrong. Salinger kills Dorothy, snapping Trish. I've got this. 
As a result, Jess must now protect Salinger in order to preserve Trish's soul. She gets Malcolm and Eric to hatch a plan to capture Trish and then become Salinger's next victim in order to draw out a confession. And this is effectively the climax of Jessica's big transformation. Every sensitive topic and traumatic insecurity are all now shrug worthy as Salinger tries to break her with them. That your family died for nothing. You believe they were sacrificed in exchange for your gifts. That they died so that you could save the world. How about your chosen profession, the private eye? <laughs> it's a lazy cliche, the individualist hero. It pays the bills. Not everyone can live off of their dead brother's settlement. Subsequently, Jessica interrogates Salinger back, taunts him into a confession, and arrests him. He's defeated precisely because Jessica has forgiven herself and can't be hurt by her old ways of thinking. Probably hard right now, aren't you? I killed Dorothy to punish you! To punish all of you! Why are you smiling? You're not the only one with a camera. But Trish is not having it. All the anger that Jess has learned to hold in and tolerate can't be held in for her and she kills him. The headache, one to ten. For Trish, five-ish. If she kills him, she goes darker. Don't. Don't! Luke Cage returns to give Jessica a pep talk, referencing his own experience with his brother and hopes that one day, when he loses himself, she'll be there for him. Is that a risk these days? Going too far? Some would say it's inevitable. In his own show, he's become the new vigilante crime sheriff lord of Harlem. So it's alluding to perhaps if either shows went on, they would have gotten together in order to keep each other grounded. And uh, I'm kind of in tears just thinking about the notion that Jessica is the one who says, I will forgive you every day back to him. And oh man, I miss these characters. But I trust you, Jessica Jones. That's saying something these days. Jess has recovered so much that now their own positions have swapped. Subsequently, when Trish tries to escape the country, Jessica outs her publicly, and when they finally confront each other, she won't give up. It's Dorothy who beat this self-righteous resolve into you. You think you're avenging her. You've become her. God damn it, stop! Jess's sister is then taken away to the raft, in tears, but she also gives a hint of a smile to Jess. There's no hard feelings, only love within the deep feelings of regret. And everyone around me dies. Not me. I'm gonna live forever. Jessica's called a hero once again, but she gives alias to Malcolm, which is a perfect place for him to find redemption. She sets up Eric with her detective friend, and the final image of the show is her contemplating leaving New York forever. However, before she makes her decision, Kilgrave's voice echoes in her mind, vindicating her decision to escape. You're right to give in. Give up. It's someone else's job now. Therefore, being the ultimate rebel, she obviously chooses to stay. This is a thematic loop back to the ending of the first episode, where she decides to stay for Starlight. As a result, despite the immense darkness in this season, it's far more oddly optimistic. It closes not on failure, but on success. Success in Jessica's ability to appropriate her trauma for the service of the present. Kilgrave's memory is not a reference point for incomprehensible pain, but her life's great victory. And through that story, she knows who she is. Everyone leaves Jessica, but what's important is that she never leaves herself. And that's what makes her the H word. My firm and the respect of my colleagues. Don't screw it up. The only thing I will leave behind is my name on that door. I brought a lot of pain to your world. They would have found me one way or another. You're gonna need people. No one goes through something like this alone. Well, allow me to be the first to try. Still a standing invitation? Always. You've forgotten what it's like to feel afraid. The rest of us have it. She had this memory of a thing, a, a creature with a, a meat face. It wasn't a memory. <sighs> meat faced creatures don't exist. That first day that you woke up, you attacked her. No! No, I would yes, never yes, do yes. that! Almost killed. You 
are the reason why I did everything I did. You did it because you're a cold-blooded killer. That's why your own daughter turned you in. She's mine to deal with. You do not get a say. And there's a hole in your soul. Just like there's a hole in mine. And so let's not use each other to fill it. But the man that she loved, that, that good guy, that just wasn't me. Trish sees things in black and white, right and wrong, or she used to. Maybe now she asks herself the same question I do. Who the hell am I to judge? Maybe I don't have to be amazing. Maybe I just made you. Jessica taught me to help people. I saved children. I wondered if that would make you proud of me. I've done a lot of damage in my life. But somehow, you're standing on top of the rubble like a shining light. Stop talking to me like I'm your baby Jesus. Take your intentionally indifferent rebel rock garb, for example. They are in your cave. You look like an asshole. It's your scar. Your mask. And your armor. I have never been more afraid than I am right now. Please. Trish, look at yourself. This isn't you. I don't want to hurt her, but I will if I have to. You already are, so long as you're dead. I want him dead, too. I'm the only one <laughs> willing to do it. You were willing to once with Kilgrave. And it nearly destroyed me. But it hasn't destroyed me. Maybe... That's my real power. I thought this was because of what Salinger did to you. Or maybe it was a side effect of your powers. But it has been there all along. I saw it when you shot my mother. And I can see it now. Maybe it is an addict thing. Generating change in the world, being effective. It's a powerful drug. But it is, but not, it is easy. not easy. Malcolm, Malcolm the, things the things I've, I've, done. I've done. You're right. You're right. You're right. It wasn't, it wasn't me. me. with what you've become. Jessica, you are now a full-blown super Do the H word. Jess, I, I've got enough of a headache as it is. I'm just saying you might want to consider going home, getting some sleep, rejoining society. I'm talking to you. Jessica Jones portrays trauma as a battle, not against individual people, but with the self. If you pull everything back, her relationship with reality is her main struggle for the reason that throughout her journey, she often doesn't know if her failing heroics is due to the world denying her results for her good intentions, or being heroic itself is merely an illusion that she's projecting into it. With Kilgrave and Jessica's mother, it shows the ease of which you can relapse under new permutations of the same problems, where remembering the wrong memories, ones that are too painful to be contextualized with the people that we develop into, can become an addictive drug. But with the Defenders and with what happened with Trish and Salinger, they also show us that it doesn't matter. The effort holds its own truth, for the reason that to make meaning out of the worst thing that's ever happened to you is something that in itself is heroic. We're our own surgeons and we're our own patients. Every season of Jessica Jones is a battle of authorship. Every traumatic rupture and affection of guilt is a lesson of empathy. And like the pressures that produce diamonds, Jessica Jones shows us that trauma gives us an opportunity to rewrite ourselves. And I think that's an important message. Defiance against a broken heart. <laughs> Thank you to everyone on Patreon. You guys are the best. I love you guys. Grab me like that again, I'll punch you so hard you see. <laughs>